a mass-based eco-fascist movement is not prevalent. And everything I've talked about up until now makes those conditions more likely if we are not skillful. I appreciated your comment the first day when you're like, the church is up there controlling through the yeah, yeah. I, I have heard that actually, it was not my fault. I have heard it, someone to say. My name is Hilary Moore. I'm from the States. I live in Louisville, Kentucky, and I use she and her pronouns. Often when we think about the right wing, we don't think about climate. Sometimes that's a hard connection, but that's really shifting in recent years. The right wing uh, engages climate in all different kinds of ways, and policy is one part of it. And it's, I talk about it as an iceberg. Policy tends to be the thing that's public and the thing that's easy to see. And what that little piece of the iceberg talks about can be all kinds of things. It can be denying climate. It can be delaying climate. It can start to bring questions into the public sphere around the processes around climate change or the bureaucracies or the climate science or even just how different groups are responding to climate. A lot of focus can be on that skepticism piece. Um, more and more people, uh, far-right groups are moving into acceptance, but not necessarily because they actually care about the climate, more that they see climate policies and engaging positively with the reality of climate change um, as a Trojan horse. It's very much about racism and xenophobia, and a lot of the dialogue is moving toward anti-immigration and keeping some people out while keeping others in, and it can be exclusionary. So, um, yeah, climate and right-wing policy, uh, I think, is going to be a very important piece for the next 10, 20 years that we have to get much more skilled at. One thing about the politics of nature or climate or the environment, however, whatever the word is that people are using, is that nature can't speak for itself, right? So whoever you are with whatever political agenda you have, you can use nature to forward the world that you want. And so there is something very important about understanding if a group on the right actually cares about nature or if they're just using nature to forward their agenda. There is a difference and a distinction there that I think we ought to pause with and take seriously. One major way that we can make those distinctions about where it is, what is this policy telling us, is to look to see what are the ideologies underneath those policies and ultimately where they're pointing to. So what is that society that they're calling into being? who belongs to that society, who's excluded from that society, what is their larger vision. I think that's one of our strengths on the left is that we do have a maximum vision, we do have uh, really good ideas and aspirations and experiments in making a more inclusive society, a more just society. But when you start to ask that question of where it is that they're using this policy to get us to, 
that's how you're going to know whether or not it's something you want to support or that you definitely do not want to support. And if they can't answer that question, right, if they're only keeping it to that policy, that's a really good indicator. There might be a red flag underneath that policy if they're not willing to articulate where this leads us as a society. When I talk about nativism in the booklet, I'm mostly talking about the very dangerous political position of trying to secure a European identity. Nativism is a complicated term, and it depends on who is using it and where you are based out of. History matters, so that adds to the context of it. Ultimately, at the heart of nativism is we belong here because we are from here, but that's always a really complicated um, identity and that's always a political process that ultimately excludes a lot of people. And if you keep following that logic, it's gonna lead you to being against immigration. It's gonna lead you to be anti um, people who are seeking refuge. And it's gonna lead you to have more exclusionary and reactionary politics. It usually leads to an engagement with the climate as a security issue. And when we think of climate as a security issue, that's um, then you put resources in a scarcity perspective. We have to keep ours, we have to keep our resources available. It also is really connected to green nationalism. Like the only way we're gonna get through is if we do our own Finland's way of doing things. And while that's understandable in some ways, it really leads us again to a society that is more fear-based, is more reactionary, um, is more skeptical of neighbors or people that don't look like us. So nativism is connected to a lot of pretty scary ideologies and worldviews that ultimately uh, exclude some people and kind of make the, the identity in favor much more fearful and often violent. Overpopulation is one of the oldest arguments that has devastating, dangerous impact in any political space. It puts the climate crisis into a scarcity mindset around resources and how many humans there are in the world. And what this does is it distracts us away from extractive capitalism. It distracts us away from contending with power and which countries are controlling um, which climate policies and setting the tone for the rest of the world. So those are like the root causes of what's actually going on, but overpopulation has us look over here. One of the most dangerous parts of it is it makes it seem like it's a personal choice, that we are in this crisis based on personal choices, and that is so far from the truth. It obscures power, and it obscures exactly the amount of resources and the amount of control that elites and corporations have, and it equates elites and corporations with one person's individual choice. And that is so far, of a dis it's so distorted and really demonizes often women and women of color about birth rates. And that is so not the issue of how we got to this crisis. That is so not the intervention point where the left needs to intervene or where we need to intervene as a global society. <laughs> Oh, like the growth? Yeah. And she's doing this. Yeah. So the, like the thing yes. that grows on it. Whoa. Yes. Yeah. 
Of course. Kun siinä kuumentaa, niin kaikki ja. Yes. Ja hän meitä. Yes, a very good price. <laughs> They don't have to govern. They don't have to be in parliament to have influence on policies or even cultural beliefs. A lot of this work is cultural work and shifting hearts and minds around um, how they relate to the transitions that we're in. So it can be through mobilizations. It can be through dramatic events. It can be through sensationalizing what is happening in our political world. Um, you don't have to have a seat in parliament to have influence. And in fact, the most effective eruptions in our cultural fabric or our belief systems don't happen in parliament. And it has a lot to do with um, how working people do or don't get their needs met. And the far right is really, really good at um, controlling reactionary politics and having people take action from fear. So we have to get really good also at not only meeting people's needs, but showing them a positive future that, um, of course, requires material shifts within government, but can't be only relied on those measures. And very often the solutions we need are, um, we need them sooner than a political process usually takes to deliver those to the people. Yeah, eco-fascism is another expression of how you don't have to have a lot of people, you don't have to have a lot of political power to have influence. You can create uh, mobilizations, you can create dramatic events, you can create hostile events also that uh, push parliament and push politicians into corners. Um, and ultimately shift like cultural beliefs and how people are relating to an issue in a way that you don't have to go through the process to become an MP, you don't have to go through traditional avenues. Unfortunately, with first person shooter mass shootings, uh, the reason why they're doing that is for ideas about eco-fascism. I think we have to build more of a united front or whatever the phrase is that we, um, that feels most accurate, but we need to learn how to work together. And I think that means for institutions and groups that are on the left and are you know, working for a liberated, more liberated world and for justice, who have resources to funnel resources to groups and to community efforts and grassroots sections of society. Um, I think that there are many ways that social change can happen. And I think especially if we understand the problem, which is not only an ecological, massive ecological problem, but massive political and social challenge that we're up against, we have to be able to bring the political institutions with the grassroots, with the community efforts, a higher degree of coordination. We have to be practicing that in this political moment. If we don't, 
we are screwed. <laughs> we're, we're not in good shape right now. And so we have to be a bit more bold, I believe. There's a ton of things that the left and progressives can do to win battles, uh, win policies, win struggles around climate and the environment when we are contending with the right. One very important way is to be very clear in our political commitments, and I think especially around anti-racism. As soon as we start to foreground nature and start to background our anti-racist politics, um, it becomes very easy to co-opt our work, to infiltrate our work. We can lose political ground, like they can roll back policies that we've already made. Um, and ultimately, we don't challenge the root causes of climate change when we start to get wishy-washy or unclear with what our political commitments are and who we're committed to. Another piece is making alliances with other progressive groups or leftist groups that we aren't in relationship with right now. We're going to have to be a bit more bold and creative, putting offers out there and, you know, getting more curious about other people doing similar kinds of work but in other places. Finding creative ways to be more connected. I think our strength and our inspiration is only stronger when we are connected to struggles um, in other places, absolutely. Um, and doing the work that we need to, the sometimes slow work, to win hearts and minds and w work with people that aren't in our movements already. Um, yeah, talking like normal people, speaking to what matters to us, trying to have meaningful conversations publicly um, in ways in that we can bring more people in. Uh, many of the things that we're already doing, but I think a bit more bold and I think a bit more creative. Yeah. In Burning Earth, Changing Europe, one of the takeaways that I talk about at the end and some of the next steps and the practical pieces are our ability to share important information across different sections of the left and across different sections of progressive movements. Um, very often, the far right, the radical right, the extreme right is not... Um, forthcoming with what they actually believe and what they actually care about and the impact they're having in other parts of society. So it's really important that we research and we figure out what they actually are doing um, and that we share that work collectively, building relationships in the way that we are also building out information about who we're up against and the impact they're having in the world. So I think, yeah. Uh, collective research is a very important part of what we can do to become stronger together. Genuinely working on relationships, organization to organization relationships with those who are being targeted by far right gr groups and people um, is going to be one to one our ability of whether or not we're effective. So really valuing, putting time, effort, creativity, resources into, um, yeah, working on an organizational level, so increasing our ability to work together and then figuring out who it is that we need to be surrounding and who it is that we need to not only defend but uplift. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to the play. <laughs> the last takeaway that I talk about in the booklet is the ability for certain movements to come together. I talk about the climate justice movement and anti-racist movements and anti-fascist movements. I think all three of them have very important skills um, and they bring different things to the table. And if those movements are able to coordinate, to talk together, there are efforts to bring these movements together and it's actually quite difficult. Um, they care about different things, but if we have the ability to understand what it is that we're working towards together, we need all three of them if we're going to fight the right. A 
a really important question that climate and environmental movements are contending with a lot more in the recent generation is why are why is the climate movement majority white in the north and why are anti-racist movements mostly people of color or black folks and I have written about this before and I think it comes out in Burning Earth Changing Europe which is um, we have so much to gain by working with each other and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of ideas about race for white folks that's like around privilege of like you can and can't do these things because you're white or you should or shouldn't do these things because you're white. And I think that's like a worthy engagement and worth contending. But I also think that that shoots ourselves in the foot for lack of a better term coming from a US person. Like um, if we're able to see the massive gains that we have and stand shoulder to shoulder that's a much different standpoint than trying to background yourself and do something because you feel bad. And so what I want to offer is um, when you have like an internationalist perspective of how movements have impact and how we're able to coordinate across nation borders, it becomes less important about your personal identity around race and more of like your ability to have impact as a political person and you can be white and that's fine, but your ability to connect with other movements is going to actually shift how you think about yourself as a political person. So I just want to put out there that, um, yeah, white privilege isn't really effective as an organizing strategy. And if we actually take a more of a shared interest approach and an internationalist approach, uh, we become way more effective and have way more impact.